Brewer and I'm Blair Penn and we're graduate students in the Counseling Psychology Department at the University of Central Oklahoma. The following video is designed for anyone who is interested in learning more information about dialectical behavior therapy, particularly when it comes to treating adolescents who are engaging in non-suicidal self-injurious behavior or NSSI. So whether you're just an individual that's interested in more information on the topic or you're a concerned parent or a friend of someone who's engaging in these behaviors, this video will provide information about the diagnosis of NSSI, what it is and what it is not, and it will also give an overview of what research is indicating to be the preferred evidence-based treatment for decreasing these behaviors as well as increasing the quality of life. So this video is just really going to be a brushstroke of what DBT is because we just don't have time to go into it. It's a very involved therapy. But at the end of the video, we'll be providing, we'll be providing resources with more detailed information. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about non-suicidal self-injury and I'm going to start out with just a definition of what it is, what it means. It is any intentional self-directed behavior that causes immediate destruction of tissue damage without suicidal intent. Most people are familiar with cutting behaviors. There is also other behaviors that adolescents engage in that's not cutting. They can also be abrading, burning, carving into their skin, and even things like hitting, punching, or head banging. So non-suicidal self-injury is listed in the most recent APA Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or the DSM-5, for the first time by itself in the Conditions for Further Study section of the book, which means that it is still relatively new um, when it comes to just talking about NSSI behavior by itself. Um, the proposed criteria is five or more days in the last year engaged in self-inflicted damage to the surface of the body. Again, it includes cutting, burning, hitting, or stabbing, and it is with no intent for death to be the result. So what are individuals getting out of engaging in these behaviors? According to the DSM-5, People who engage in NSSI have one or more of the following expectations. The first is to gain relief from a negative state. The second is to resolve an interpersonal difficulty. And the third is to um, increase or induce a positive feeling state. Now, negative uh, feeling or thought can come from a variety of areas. This can be coming from anxiety or depression. It can be coming from guilt or self-criticism or even just a general distress. The self-injury is associated with at least one, um, that interpersonal difficulty or the negative feeling state happens just prior to engaging in the behavior. There's a preoccupation with the behavior that's difficult to control. They're thinking about this behavior, whether they're acting on it or not. There are a few things that might look like NSSI, but they're not quite the same thing. The first of these is trichotillomania, which is repetitive pulling of hair. The next is excoriation, which is repetitive skin picking. Now, both of these things also might potentially cause uh, tissue damage, but they are both housed under obsessive compulsive disorders and NSSI is not. It is not also infrequent nail biting or picking just scabs infrequently. NSSI behavior is very frequent, even almost daily in some cases, and so it might seem like the same thing, but not quite. It is also not self-injury associated with autism or a psychotic disorder. Earlier I talked about potentially headbanging. Um, this is different from headbanging that is coming from a neurodevelopmental disorder or psychotic disorder or from autism. And it's also not part of a suicide attempt or intent. Now this seems like that would be obvious to say is that it's part of the name of this disorder, that it is not the same thing. Um, and in most cases, most research is saying that people that engage in these behaviors don't ever contemplate suicide. However, there are other studies that say that there is a link between non-suicidal self-injury and suicide attempt or intent. Though there's still a lot to be learned in this area, at least part of that is coming from the fact that a lot of these individuals have a second diagnosis. They have NSSI and then they have something else going on. 
In particular, a lot of individuals have depression, and that suicidal intent might be coming from the depression. Another thing to think about is that sometimes an individual's circumstances might change. So if the depression worsens or their circumstances worsen, because they are used to cutting themselves frequently, they have lowered that inhibition for harming themselves. So if their situation kind of gets worse and suicidal intent becomes a part of the picture, um, it, is, it might be easier for them to harm themselves lethally. It's also important to note that NSSI is not part of a socially accepted or religious practice. Examples of, of socially acceptable practices is piercings or gauging or tattooing or even suspension. Um, it's also not part of a cultural ritual, um, which some of those you know, might seem different to us, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad thing, it's just a difference in culture and is not in SSI behavior. So who is engaging in these behaviors? The onset is usually 11 to 15 years. This is mostly happening in adolescents and young adults. Um, the percentage is around 15 to 36 percent, the highest of that being in those adolescent years. 1 to 3 percent of adults in the United States are engaging in these behaviors, but we do see a decline at a, in somewhere around the late um, 20s. Now there is also a difference in the prevalence between gender. Um, females are more likely to engage in these behaviors than males from what research is indicating. It's about a 3 to 1 ratio. There's also a difference in how they're engaging in these behaviors. Females are more likely to engage in a cutting kind of behavior, where males are more likely um, to the burning or uh, hitting, punching, those kinds of, of behaviors. So in some cases, NSSI is diagnosed comorbid with another disorder, which means that an individual has two different diagnoses. 70 to 75 percent of patients with borderline personality disorder also have NSSI. Uh, Self-injury is highly correlated with disorders that have emotion dysregulation and that's a big part of the criteria for borderline disorder and so that's why we see it there. 69 percent of those with dissociative disorders, 25 to 60 percent of those with an eating disorder, that's a pretty wide range. It kind of depends on the eating disorder. The the sixty percent, the largest of those coming from the from anorexia binge purge type. Forty one percent of adolescents who are diagnosed with major depressive disorder, and a quarter to a third of adolescents who have alcohol dependence. Now, it's very important to note here that just because psychopathology increases the risks, there are a lot of adolescents who engage in NSSI who do not meet criteria for any disorder. It's very important for individuals who are engaging in NSSI behavior to not be labeled as having a disorder, especially the younger adolescents whose personality is still developing. So how does NSSI manifest? What does it look like? Well, cutting is the most well-known that most people are aware of. In the case of cutting, this is usually seen on the forearms and on the thighs. These are parallel superficial cuts, but it's a they're very characteristic pattern of scars. People usually know it when they see it. Although cutting is the one we hear about the most, there are a lot of other ways that adolescents are engaging in these behaviors. One of which is burning, and this is not just cigarette burning. A lot of times this is coming from things that are accessible to them, like eraser burns. They're also using needles or sharp objects to prick um, their skin, and then um, sometimes they're actually stabbing, and usually this is seen on the upper arms where it's not as visible. The re reasons for cutting are diverse. We know that this is a maladaptive um, coping mechanism. The largest reason people say that they engage in these behaviors is very paradoxical. For um, a lot of people, if they get a cut or they cut themselves, it actually causes anxiety. For these individuals, though, they say that it actually is a release of anxiety or tension or guilt or whatever it is that they are feeling. 
They often report feeling sadness or anxiety right before engaging and then feeling that release as soon as they engage in the behavior. There are also some other reasons. Um, some say that they do it to feel something in the presence of nothing. And also, uh, there are others that do it punitively as a form of self-punishment. So we know that NSSI is epidemic. We hear about that quite a bit. Um, but there is a common misconception that this behavior is commonly spreading through schools, that it's widely being used as a means of inclusion or group membership. And some of that may be true. But um, in the most cases, these are very private events. Um, the first occasion is generally accidental. They were really distressed and some, something occurred. They, they accidentally cut themselves, discovered that there was a release, and it just kind of went from there. Many people do not tell their friends or their family, and they also do not um, seek medical attention. Um, this is a really important piece to talk about because this is where NSSI behavior becomes dangerous. A lot of times these individuals are not using implements that are clean, so infection um, is occurring. Um, another thing that happens quite frequently is that they didn't intend to cut in certain areas or as deeply, um, and they end up bleeding more than they can control, and that can become an issue. Now this is just an overview of what NSSI is, and next we will talk about dialectical behavior therapy and how this is being used to decrease these behaviors. Okay, so Amy just talked to us about kind of defining NSSI, what it is, what it is not, where it could have possibly come from, things like that, and I think it's necessary to do the same thing with DBT. Um, first and foremost, I want to give credit where credit is due. DBT was developed by a woman named Marsha Linehan, and she developed this therapy while she was working with individuals who were highly suicidal and self-injurious. So it was originally created for the adult population, but has since been modified for adolescents, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what is DBT? We'll kind of break down the components. Um, Dialectics first. We'll kind of get a, a working de definition of what dialectics is. It's a philosophy in which you examine and discuss two opposing ideas to find the truth somewhere in there. For DBT specifically, this is change and acceptance. You're trying to find the balance between change and acceptance. Recognizing that you need to make changes to um, unhealthy behaviors while simultaneously being able to accept um, the situation and, and the circumstances and being okay with that. Uh, the behavioral component is like we just talked about. That's part of changing those behaviors. And then acceptance, it's important to note that there's something called radical acceptance. And this is giving uh, these adolescents a coping mechanism to be okay with life circumstances. It's, it's very much a form of just total acceptance of how things are and being able to be okay in that environment. So next, we're going to talk about how DBT views NSSI, how it kind of comes to pass. Um, this, once again, is a theory that was proposed by Marsha Linehan and the two developers, or the two individuals who modified DBT for adolescents, uh, found that this theory was still uh, pertinent to these adolescents. So it's called biosocial theory, and there are two components to biosocial theory. One is emotional dysregulation, and the other is an invalidating environment. We're going to define those for you. So emotional dysregulation, a good way to look at it is like an emotional, emotional vulnerability. Um, a lot of times these adolescents can't really label their emotional distress. They have a difficulty recognizing it for what it is. Um, and an important piece of this is that they've kind of learned that they can't trust their emotional response to certain stimuli. So they don't know if they're having an appropriate emotional response to the circumstance. And this is kind of um, fed by that invalidating environment piece in which these adolescents' emotional responses have been dismissed or invalidated or something along those lines so that 
they don't learn that they're having a proper emotional response. And this can be as easy as something like we say a lot in our society, that's just a normal teenage thing to do. So if a kid comes home super distressed from school because they had a breakup, and I mean, they're distraught, it's common for us to say, well, that's just a typical part of life, or that's a teenage, typical teenage thing, instead of validating those emotions. And for some kids, that can really uh, spiral. So just as a reminder, the reason that DBT is effective for these adolescents is because it focuses not only on change, but being able to accept the environment for what it is without judgment. So next we're going to talk about how DBT was modified for adolescents. There are two researchers who modified this, Miller and Rathis, and one thing that they realized is, like we've said before, you know, DBT is a very intensive treatment, and because of that, it tends to be a very long treatment, and there were high dropout rates for these adolescents, so they quickly pared it down from being a one-year treatment to 16 weeks. Um, another change that they made is that there is a lot more emphasis on familial involvement. Um, family members are kind of present throughout the entire treatment, which is necessary for these teens. Another component of it is that there's individual therapy, family therapy, and group therapy. So these kids are attending three sessions a week. Um, so that totals out to about 48 sessions for the entire treatment. Another really unique uh, aspect of DBT that makes it so effective is having a consultation team. So like we just said, there's individual, group, and family therapy, and each, each mode of therapy has its own therapist. So this consultation team brings them together, all the therapists are there, to make sure that they're all on the same page, working on the same problem behaviors, that they're aware of what's occurring in each mode of therapy, and that they're doing what's most effective for the treatment for these teens. So DBT treatment is comprised of pretreatment and four treatment stages. Each one of these stages has very specific behavioral targets. And these targets are defined as making changes in very specific behaviors that are explicitly identified as needing change by both the therapist and the adolescent. So because our focus here is on NSSI and we only have a certain amount of time, we're going to stick with stage one and not really go over stages two through four. The reason for this is that stages two through four focus a little bit more on maintenance and generalizing what is learned in stage one to other areas of, the, of, of life. So we're just going to talk about pretreatment and stage one for our purposes. So pretreatment, the goals of pretreatment are... Um, informing and orienting the adolescent and the family to what DBT looks like and also getting commitment from all parties, the therapist, the individual, adolescent, and their families. Pretreatment usually lasts for about, lasts for two to three sessions um, and family is usually a part of this. Even though it occurs in individual uh, therapy, the family comes along so that they can really be informed of what this therapy looks like and also be there to lend their commitment. Um, so the therapist, the individual, and the family all makes a commitment to therapy, and this creates an environment for an optimal outcome. Next, we're gonna kinda of break down the target behaviors for stage one. So stage one focuses on decreasing life-threatening behaviors, decreasing therapy interfering behaviors, decreasing quality of life interfering behaviors, and increasing behavioral skills. So for individual therapy, uh, well actually for all modes of therapy, let me take that back. For all modes of therapy, clients are asked to write down every instance of the target behaviors on a diary card and bring those into session so that the therapist can accurately see how much these are occurring and if they are decreasing over time. First, we're really going to focus on decreasing those life-threatening behaviors. Um, these can include things like suicidal attempts, suicidal ideation, but obviously for our purposes, we're just looking at NSSI as being that life-threatening behavior. Next, a therapist is going to address therapy interfering behaviors. And these are certain behaviors that just kind of commonly interfere with the therapeutic process. They include things like not attending session regularly, and not being attentive in session. 
And so next is those quality of life interfering behaviors. These can be things like staying in an abusive relationship or dropping out of school. Um, they cover kind of the whole gamut, school, work, life. And so a lot of times during stage one, these are really going to mirror those life-threatening behaviors because that's going to be the most pressing thing to cover. So if you have a quality of life interfering behavior, like let's say isolating yourself, that, that merits uh, attention, but not quite as much as something like harming yourself. So that's what you're going to focus on first. And then as we've mentioned, DBT focuses on balancing change and acceptance. And the best uh, depiction of this occurs in those increasing behavioral skills, those four skills that, that these teens are taught. And those are emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, mindfulness, and distress tolerance. So change is gonna be seen during emotion regulation and interpersonal effectiveness. That's where you're um, targeting these maladaptive behaviors and, and replacing them with more adaptive behaviors. Acceptance is really gonna be taught during mindfulness and distress tolerance. Like we said, giving these kids coping mechanisms to be okay with who they are, how they are, and the environment as a whole, just being okay. Okay, so as previously mentioned, one of the first things we're concerned with in DBT is decreasing life-threatening behaviors. So this is addressed up front in both individual and group therapy. One of the ways this is achieved is by teaching a skill called distress tolerance. So distress tolerance equips these adolescents with coping mechanisms when they're feeling emotionally overwhelmed. Also, it simultaneously decreases those life-threatening behaviors while increasing healthy behavioral skills. So the focus of individual therapy within DBT is really crisis intervention, especially in stage one. Therefore, we want to equip these adolescents with coping mechanisms to prevent self-harm. One of the ways this is done in distress tolerance training is through teaching distraction behaviors. These can be things like screaming into a pillow or throwing a soft object against a wall instead of cutting when they really feel that urge to cut when they're emotionally overwhelmed. The following provides an example of what this looks like in an individual therapy session. Okay, Lindsay, so the last time you came in, if you can recall, we talked about what it was gonna look like to progress through this treatment, what different stages we were gonna go through and the target behaviors for those specific stages. Now we decided here in the beginning it would be most pressing for us to start with your self-harm behaviors. Do you still feel like that's a place, a good place for you to start? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. And I know that it can be a little bit fearful to think about taking away something that's worked as a coping mechanism for you. But our main goal for today is going to be to find something to replace that, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're going to use is something that we call distraction behaviors and hopefully that will work um, to both release the emotion that you're able to release through cutting and at the same time distract you from the events that caused you to feel that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let me know what you think of when you hear the term distraction behaviors. Uh, I think of just behaviors to help distract me from the situation that is stressing me out to make me feel like the need to cut. Kind of like screaming or journaling or kind of like the top two that kind of pop into my head. Yeah, that's exactly right. Your explanation of it is exactly right. So you mentioned um, screaming and journaling. Have you tried either one of those things? Yeah, kind of. Um, I tried journaling, but I kind of figured out, like the few times I have tried it, that I wouldn't get really in depth with it like I probably should have okay but even when I did I kind of felt more like I was still being more on the negative side of it like it wasn't making me feel any better it was kind of making me more dwell on the st stressful situation than sure. I should have been okay so you tried it and you felt like maybe you got a little bit of that release of emotion like mm -hmm. you said yeah. um but it it kept you ruminating on the past, on the event that caused you to feel that way. So in the end, it really didn't do any distracting at all. And in fact, maybe intensified those emotions a little bit. Okay, so 
I'm going to throw out a list of things that have been shown to be helpful for other people that are experiencing the same kind of problems that you're going through right now. And we'll try and hopefully figure out one that, that seems appealing to you and sounds like it would be effective for you. So um, there's, instead of just screaming in general, you can scream into a pillow. And then that way, maybe if you're screaming and venting about your little sister, who I know we've talked about is kind of a pain for you. So if you're screaming about her sh into a pillow, she won't be able to hear you. And that'll keep from arguments from happening between okay. the two of you. Um, you can also take like a sock, a rolled up sock or a foam ball and just throw it against the wall as hard as you possibly can. There's that. Some people find it helpful and certainly distracting to stick their hand in like a bucket of ice cold water, squeeze a piece of frozen fruit, something along those lines. Does anything that I just talked about sound like it would work for you? Yeah, I think the screaming to a pillow I might want to try out and okay. kind of see if that works for me. Great. So then this week, whenever you get that real intense urge that you need to cut and you need to release that emotion, grab the closest pillow and start screaming. All right, sounds okay. good. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about mindfulness, which is part of the acceptance piece of stage one. Mindfulness is a valuable skill that has been a part of Eastern philosophy for thousands of years. It has kind of migrated over here over time. Um, it started with chronic pain management and just kind of infiltrated into some different psychotherapies, including dialectical behavior therapy. Um, there is promising research that this can be a useful adjunct to these evidence-based treatments. So mindfulness is a component that is um, seen consistently over individual, group, and family therapy. Um, remember that what a lot of these clients have in common is emotion dysregulation. Um, when they become overwhelmed with emotion, they have a hard time making decisions or knowing what to do with the, the feelings that they're having, which in the case of adolescents with NSSI behavior, this is when they might start cutting or doing some of these other behaviors. So mindfulness does a few things. Um, it helps clients focus on one thing at a time in the present moment um, to get better control and soothe those overwhelming emotions. It also helps them to identify and separate judgmental thoughts from the experiences they're having. And it also helps clients to uh, develop a DBT skill called Wise Mind. Wise Mind is the ability to make healthy decisions based on rational thought and emotion. Um, decision, so it's a decision making process that balances the reasoning um, of thoughts with the emotions that they're having. Um, and so the following is a demonstration of what um, teaching wise mind might look like in an individual therapy session. Okay, Lindsay, the last few sessions we've been working on mindfulness and that's just the idea of being able to stay in the present moment and not judge yourself or be critical of yourself, especially when your emotions are running really high. How's that been working out for you? Um, it's been going pretty good. Um, I still have my bad days and I still have my good days, but I've noticed that through with I've been having more good days than I've had bad days. So. Okay, okay, great. And and two, we gotta remember that this is a skill that's gonna be part of that radical acceptance that we talked about of being able to tolerate a situation when it's highly emotional using that mindfulness training. Yeah. So that's been working working out okay for you so far? Yeah, it's been, you know, still kind of tough trying to get my mind out of where it used to be, but I do think I am getting slowly a little bit better at it okay. day by day. Okay, great. And that's great that you're willing to practice it when you're not here because mm -hmm. mindfulness is all about the practice and that's, that's when it becomes really important is just working on that skill. So today I'd like to build on that skill and work on helping you make some good decisions when emotions are running really high. Does that sound like something that would be useful to you? Yeah, I do. Okay. All right. Well, let's, I'm going to start by showing you this diagram. And what we're going to work on is called wise mind. And wise mind is balancing emotion with reason. And so if you, when you're using your emotion mind, when you're making a decision, you're doing it purely on emotion without any thoughts of, or logic at all. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that, if you're using your reason mind, it's completely analytical and logical without using any emotion 
at all. And so either one of those by themselves can be problematic yeah. if you're just using one or the other. And so the idea is to use wise mind. And that's just the idea of seeing both the value in the reason and in the emotion and kind of balancing the two. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you so far? Yeah, so far. Okay. All right, so, um, and it might be kind of a difficult thing to do at first, especially, like I said, emotions can run high and it's kind of hard to stay in that balance, and so that's why practicing it is really important. Um, okay, so first of all, I want to ask you, can you think of a situation that you've been in recently that you were making decisions purely on reason? Uh, yeah, there was a situation that happened at work when I was checking a guy out. Um, some things didn't, you know, really add up in his mind. And I was able to kind of talk him down and reason with him, like, you know, this is how it was supposed to be. And I was able, you know, to kind of just calm this whole situation down and just resolve it, you know. Okay, so you have found that you can use your reason when you're at work. Yeah. And that we're in work situations, working with customers, you're able to use your logic. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Now, can you think of a time when you made a decision purely based on emotion? Uh, yeah. Um, when I went to theater, pra theater practice the other day, um, wasn't really having the best day, and my director was not helping in the slightest bit. He was just yelling and just, you know, really not talking down to me. So I just got really, really angry and just made the decision that I'm just going to leave. Okay. And I just kind of... You know, zoomed out of there. Okay, so you were in a situation where you were really angry and you were probably really frustrated. Yeah. And it was probably really hard to think clearly, and so it was just mm -hmm. easier to leave. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really common uh, for a lot of people, and so that's why this is a, a really um, useful tool for people to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we want to do is I would like to work on an exercise that can, we can kind of practice wise mind, and I think it'd be good if it's okay with you to use the theater example that you just gave. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So remember when we were practicing mindfulness and we were working on breathing and how when you breathe in, you act like your stomach is a balloon and you, and you fill it up. And then mm -hmm. when you exhale, then you pull your stomach back in. Yeah. Okay. Well, in a few minutes, I want us to practice doing that. We're going to do some of that breathing. And this time I want you to think back about that situation at the theater and think about how angry you were. Mm -hmm. And when you think about um, yourself leaving, when you're breathing in, think, is this wise mind? Does that make sense? Yeah. And then when you're breathing out and you're exhaling, then think, um, just listen for the answer. And it's not, it's not going to come right away. It's going to take some time and, and several breaths. But the idea is that, that you can practice this in situations that have already happened and you get really good at kind of balancing those two things and taking some time to kind of get in the present moment, mm -hmm. then when a situation does come up, then maybe you're, you're more apt to be able to use wise mind in that moment. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good? Yeah, it does. Okay, all right, well, we'll we're gonna try this out and see how that goes, okay? Okay. This was just one example of what teaching wise mind to a client might look like. There are a variety of different wise mind exercises that might be better for your individual client. You can find these exercises along with other mindfulness exercises in the resources at the end of this video. We hope that this video has provided some useful information about non-suicidal self-injury as well as the preferred evidence-based treatment for reducing these behaviors as well as giving these adolescents an adaptive style of coping. And like we said in the beginning, this video just scratches the surface of what DBT really looks like. So if you're more interested in DBT for yourself or a loved one, please contact a licensed professional in your area that is specifically trained in this therapy. For more information, you can link to the following websites or search for the resources that give a more in-depth view of what DBT is and informed much of this video.